Previously, on Realms of Nerds, The Return of Ornon. The Plain of Doom holds promise. Warriors who have been lost eternally can be found. Enter the land of eternal strife. There you'll find your purpose. A tall, thin figure dressed completely in form-fitting black leather armor has slipped out from behind a rock and grabs Brunhilde and uh, pulls her to the ground. You make too much noise. Three figures dressed in gigantic suits of blood red armor jump uh, off the top of sort of an embankment about ten feet down and land in the middle of these ogres and start fighting them. I assume that you must be worthy heroes since you are clearly not a foe and you have gained access to the plains. Well, if you'll accompany me back to the castle, I can explain everything there. My name is Michael, and I am the first paladin of Bahamut. When we left off last week, you guys have just met Michael on the battlefield, and he has introduced himself as the first paladin of Bahamut. I'm sorry, sir, but if you're the first paladin of Bahamut, approximately how old do you think you are? And I demand proof. Well, I can't really say that I know exactly how old I am. Time seems to pass a little bit differently inside of here. Yeah, I bet it does. <laughs> As far as proof, there's nothing I can show you now. If you will accompany me back to the castle, I can show you the records that I have. Your paladin certificate? <laughs> not, not quite. More uh, historical tomes. That is, unless you have some uh, sort of a test in mind for me, so I can prove my loyalty to Bahamut now. Oh, so a test for proven loyalty. I thought you were testing about, like, you know, how long you've been fucking in here. Yes, I agree with my companion. What proof do you have that time is no longer of the essence, as it were? Well, uh, the story is somewhat difficult to explain. Um, look, it's kind of a long story. I feel like standing here on this bloody battlefield is maybe not the best place to tell it. Uh, will you accompany me back to the castle? Agree. Do we have much other choice? Well, I, I am merely a guardian of the castle. I suppose as long as you bear us no ill will, you are welcome to wander this barren wasteland until you die. But, uh, Sounds I wouldn't like advise it. I say we go yeah, to the castle. Yeah, sounds like you're back home, huh, John? Oh, no, definitely. Anyways, I, um... I, I don't think I got your names. My name is Sibo. Hey, shut the fuck up. Sorry <laughs> for my friend here. This here's Joan. My name's Sibo. Um, I'm from the house Nim. Uh, let's see here. We got Ramosh, the dragon boy over there. I can introduce myself. I am Mikhail. I am the next in the order of the High Priests of Bahamut, the same order which you have claimed. And, um, this lovely lady here, this is, uh, Brunhilde. Nice to meet you, sir. Behind you, one of the warriors that was clad in the black sort of stealth armor approaches, <coughs> and, uh, removing their mask, you see that this is an elven woman. Probably about five feet tall. She has fair skin... Dark, black hair, and she says, Well, hello. Holy hell, where did you come from? Oh, I, I'm sorry. Sometimes I forget that I'm not quite in the presence of those that are used to me being so stealthy. So, question. Is this the same person that grabbed me from behind and put her hands over my face? And 
Uh, yeah, that will be her. But here's the real question. Does he know that it's her? She. I'm referring to... That's fair enough, yes. <laughs> right. I'm referring to the character. But does this character know? Unless he has some reason for knowing, I don't think so. Or she, I say. Unless she has some reason for knowing, I don't think so. Or she gives a small pseudo bow and says, My name is Sage. And how do you do, Sage? Oh, look at you, you playing do? the charmer again. <laughs> You're funny, Sebo. You can, ign- <laughs> you can ignore the small short stack over there. Sage, are you a ranking member of the followers of Bahamut, I understand? Oh, no, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me I more. Like her. <laughs> Tell me more. No, uh... Michael and his group are the, the representatives of Bahamut. Then what, pray tell, is your motivation in alignment with this group? Well, protecting the castle, of course. All right, we've been talking about this castle damn long enough. Let's just go there so we can be there if we're going to talk about it all so much. Agree. I agree. Come, I will lead the way. I like you, Michael. So, uh, Michael leads the way. Because he told you to come. Um. <laughs> no, because he's not Mikael. He's not an asshole follower of Bahamut. He's the cool follower. He's like rad dude Steve. <laughs> Bahamut is the cult of war. Yeah. He seems like a pretty chill dude. Chill dude Steve. Carry on. So, uh, yeah, he leads you along. Doesn't take too much longer till you guys get to the castle. Uh, like I said, you were getting fairly close when you came upon this group here. So, uh, as you approach, you come up to the front gate, which, uh, is very well fortified. There's two guard towers with a big heavy gate and a portcullis. And then, um, past that is a drawbridge and then the walls of the castle. Wow. Most impressive. Yeah, for real. It looks like a castle, I assume. I've never really seen one other than in Beacon. The stonework on this thing is amazing. This thing has had to have been around here for centuries. Oh, much longer than centuries. It's been here for ages. And tell me exactly, Michael, who owns this castle? The king. Sorry. Who, pray tell, is the king? Again, uh, many of your questions will be answered once, once we, we get, get inside. Once we get in the fucking gate, yeah, let's uh, go. Let's get moving. Also, are there guards patrolling outside? Oh, we yo, oh, we yo, back and forth. Oh, we we yo, boom, 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 Uh, yes, there are a lot of guards outside. Solid. There are uh, quite a few up in the guard towers. There's about four of them standing outside the gate dressed in armor similar to Michael's, that sort of kind of magical suit of extra large armor. And um, as you approach, uh, the four of them salute him. And one of them says, So your mission was a success then? Well, of course, aren't they always? (laughs) Ha! I like this one. Yeah, who knew that <laughs> Paladins of Bahamut could actually be cool, you know? So much better than those, uh, those... <laughs> sorry, Mikhail. I'm not sorry at all. <laughs> at least as our branch of the cult of Bahamut does not profess to bring the law with us wherever we go. Neither do we keep our hands in other people's pockets. We have, we have our own lined well enough. I've seen his work firsthand. I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of it. Ooh, wait, your branch? Is like is, is is this like a bank? Yeah, is this some kind of corporation that we're talking about? <laughs> the Whoa. corporation of Muhammad. <laughs> Bahamut Corp. Go join us today. Positions opening weekly. Bahamut Corp. LLC. Killing Calm people since now. the first Get age. Your job. Like many other corporations, we do have goods and services. However, those happen to be warlords' heads. Murder. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, I would like you to meet. He gestures to his left here. I would like you to meet Mikael. He is also a follower of Bahamut. And so the four at the gate all turn and they salute you. 
soon to be high priest. I have only my final destiny to achieve before attaining my final rank. Yeah, but nobody gives a damn. Come okay. on, Joan, let's show some respect. The leather cat <laughs> the leather clad kink in the back requires a closet for a room. He, however, is only required to be a heckler. We bring him along for entertainment. Long. Yes. Uh, we long had a jester here in the courts until he was unfortunately slain. I understand entirely. It provides quite a bit of comedic relief to the day. Did your jester ever grow at random times? <laughs> Because that tends to happen with our guy. Only when he was in bed with a beautiful lady. Oh, 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 oh Michael. And while they were in the middle of uh, mocking Mikael, Sibo and Joan definitely did a high five moment. Joan leaned down a little bit and Sibo just like jumped the fuck up and just like the sweetest high five you've ever seen. Was it crisp? It was crisp. Roll for a high five. <laughs> you can't tell me it was a sweet high five without rolling for that's it. That's fair. This is D and D performance. Yeah, it's gonna be a performance. Sebo rolls a seventeen. Joan got an eight. <laughs> okay. Sebo has perfect high five form. Joan cannot get the whole aim for the elbow thing down, and his hand moves out of the way, and Sebo actually smacks him in the dick. <laughs> Really? Don't worry about me. I'll just be Literally. back here. So, um, I assume you guys want to proceed inside now? Yes, yeah, except that Joan's on the floor hurt. Okay. Well, ground, we're outside. <laughs> <laughs> and softly in the background plays, I hurt myself <laughs> today. <laughs> I mean, except he didn't. Sivo well, hurt I mean, him. It was his own actions that caused yeah, no it. Regrets. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Anyways, Michael looks up to the top of the tower Open the gate! And uh, you see a head peek over the top, and you hear from farther up, Oh, we've got more visitors again! Yes, more have come! Perhaps the true heroes we are looking for! Wow, look at that! Years and years of no visitors, and then suddenly, two groups within a week! Who would have thought? And uh, you hear the gate start to open. The murder leans down over. Your mother was a hamster, and, and your father smoked of elderberries. Now leave me for the don't you a second time. I will fight in your general direction. As uh, they were walking through the gate, Sibo asked Michael, "Um, Michael, did that fine lad up there say that we're the second group that's come through here recently?" Yes, that's correct. We had some other visitors come in not but a week ago. Interesting. And, um, uh, who, who exactly were these, these visitors? Uh, they were travelers, a, a band of heroes like yourself. I'm sure you'll meet them soon. Um, so you, uh, you head in, and, uh, Wait, 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 wait. How long is a week? You mentioned a week, and you said you were, that time works weird here. Tell me more. Well, Joan, to answer your question, uh, short periods of time are easy. You know, we do, in fact, still have clocks to tell the time with. It's when we get into discussions of decades, centuries, millennia, it, it all kind of can get a little bit jumbled sometimes. Are you saying you may have been here for a millennia or more? Yes, I, um... Like I said, once we get inside, more will be explained. I, uh, I believe that we have been here from the travelers that have come through the years. I believe that this castle has stood inside since the beginning of what you would refer to as the Second Age. That is fuck fucking wild. I would like to uh, do an arcana check on basically the aura surrounding the castle if I can. Okay, sure. Do an aura. Check, I guess. Arcana. Yes, but I want to say aura. It makes it sound very spiritual. 13. Yeah, you are just getting, like, blasted with magic from everywhere. Does his hair ruffle? I have to change color. <laughs> <laughs> Mikael, yeah. your hair is, uh, <laughs> Mikael, Mikael canonically has frosted tips now. <laughs> no, but um... But his hair's already silver, so what is it, like... White tips. It's white. It's just white. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh... He looks like fucking Guy Fieri, you know? <laughs> he just got taken to Magic Town. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like, 
everything in here is kind of just radiating magic in a general way. So, uh, yeah, so you walk inside, uh, through the big wooden, uh, doors that sort of serve as the, the entrance to the castle, and there is a big foyer with a large staircase at the far end, just like this sort of black, polished marble floor, and these thick columns going up, uh, on either side that match the floor, and each one of them has torches on all four sides, just lighting up the room. And, uh, yeah, it's a pretty sweet entrance to a castle. Nice digs you got here, Michael. Well, thank you, I guess. It's not really my castle, but... I mean, do you live here? Yes. Good enough. <laughs> all right, then. I would like to do a perception check to check for banners, like, indicating... You know, like a coat of arms. I'm looking more or less for a coat of arms or like banners indicating loyalty or alignment in the hall. Yeah, do a check. Can I do a check also to see where the stonework of this originates from? That's an 11. The only banner you find is Bruce. Okay, uh, yeah, Ray, go ahead. Um, that's a 17 then. As far as you can tell, uh, most of the stonework in here came from somewhere somewhat local to where you are. So you can tell that this was, even though you can't pin down like a specific race that would have built this, you can tell that whoever it was was craftsmen that were absolutely at the top of their game. I would even go so far as to say that it's craftsmanship on a level that you have never even seen before. This building is, just by the age of the stonework, is ancient. However, there is zero disrepair at all. Everything looks as sort of new and well-made as the day that it was made. Um, as far as banners go, your role was, even though it was kind of a terrible role, it was still enough because it's pretty easy. Hanging down from the ceiling uh, about 50 feet or so from the door, uh, coming down quite a ways off the ceiling, is a large red banner, and emblazoned on it is a black sigil of a bear. No other banners? That is the only banner you see. Yeah, yeah. And, and you were barely able, able to make that one out. <laughs> da dun I, so, are you gonna dead. continue heckling ourselves or each other or <laughs> Well if you if you would hold on a second. Time to heckle some more. <clears throat> so uh, Michael, um you said or he said I don't remember because it's been a while. Back at the gate entrance with that conversation with the guy up there to open up, it was mentioned something about us maybe being the heroes or the something you needed. To break some spell or something or something. I don't know. I was kind of busy. Well, I can't really imagine what you were busy with. I was kind of the only thing around for you to look at. But, I may have been uh, on the ground behind you in pain. Don't worry about it. And uh, he, he turns and looks at me, Kyle, and says, It's good that you're protecting this one. I don't think he'd get along well on his own. <laughs> if only you knew. Uh, oh, I like you, Michael. Yes, uh, more than a few uh, accidents have been uh, surrounding this dear fellow that we have kept track of. For the record, I was recently put on trial by a group of bandits for killing over a hundred men from uh, the Fist. So, and then I he set a hot tub on fire. I think I'd do fine on my own. Any fool can be a killer. It takes a true heart to be a warrior. Spoken well, Michael. Anyways, uh, all of you come with me. He <coughs> leads you down a, a passageway off to your left, and uh, you go along a little ways. You come to a very heavy iron door, and there are two guards uh, standing in front of it. And as they see you coming, they uh, unlock the door and swing it open, and you step inside. So this room is double the size of the entrance that you were in. The, so just absolutely a massive room. And every single square inch 
is crammed with weapons. We're talking like vaulted ceilings, like 20 feet tall. There's rows and rows of shelves. And literally like every conceivable piece of armor or weaponry is just like arrayed everywhere. So and- this is the throne room, right? Because it'd be pretty <laughs> kick-ass throne room if it was. Can I find a Warhammer in here finally? <laughs> <laughs> this is the armory of the castle guards. We have been collecting for a very long time, as I, uh, I'm sure you've been able to ascertain. Quite a bit has gone into this collection. But anyways, and he gestures, and there's a, a section where there's a few open berths, almost like like a locker kind of space. And uh, he gestures to those and says, any gear that you don't want to carry around with you, you may stow in here for your time staying at the castle. No, I'm good. I don't think I'd trust anybody with this. Yeah, I bet you ain't never seen one of these before. And he pulls out his gun and shows it to Michael. He actually goes over to a large uh, leather-bound uh, book that's sitting in the corner. And he flips it open and looks through it and uh, consults it for a moment. And looking back up at you, goes, row F, shelf 37, uh, should be about two-thirds of the way down. Fuck. Is Joan going to go to the shelf that I gave you? or you Yeah, just... sure, why not? Okay, so Joan goes off that Fuck way. Fuck yeah. So he, uh, he actually walks over. There is a, an area yeah. off to the side that kind of is uh, sort of a, an alcove, a uh, very long but a shallow sort of <clears throat> room. And uh, you see that there are several other suits of armor similar to what Michael is wearing in there. So he actually kind of walks in, like walks into that backwards. And as he gets in, he reaches and sort of hits a. You can't really tell something <coughs> underneath one of the armor plates that he's wearing, and the front of this armor uh, pops open, and he steps out of it. So without the armor, he is still about six feet tall. Uh, just a really solidly built guy. Um, In the background is Black Sabbath. I am Iron Man. <laughs> sure, yeah. Cool. I feel like this is literally like the Crusader armor from Overwatch. <laughs> no, say, because that armor, that armor, that armor is the size of Reinhardt, though. It, it this is more like the. Uh, this is this is the like the Mjolnir piece. armor from Halo. This is kind of I was about to make an even more obscure reference that I think two of you would get. So anyways, the closest comparison to something you're actually going to know is the Space Marines from Warhammer. Really? You have no idea? No sir. Okay. Anyways, how about the, so, the exo suits from Bionicle when they go down to fight the Barok? There you go. Obscure reference. That t- <laughs> I got that I one. got that. Hey, that's one more. Than- Wait, Bronson, did you get it? Oh, one more than I thought would get <sighs> it. Anyways, so... Description growing up. Anyways, so he steps out of this armor, and uh, so he is a, a human, about six feet tall, very solidly built. Um, he's got a closely kept black beard, and jet black hair that is cut long-ish. He's kind of got it sort of uh, pulled to the back of his head. Think sort of uh, Matthew McConaughey sort of style. Alright, alright, alright. All right. <laughs> and uh, then he's wearing uh, some like leather armor pieces that almost mirror the, the bigger armor that he was wearing. You kind of get the idea that this stuff is almost like kind of impact resistance to be underneath this giant metal armor that he's wearing. Well, I do enjoy the power of that armor, but it is nice to take it off and be able to stretch every once in a while. At that point, Joan returns, and (laughs) he is carrying a large four-barreled shotgun. Whoa, what the actual fuck is this, Michael? <laughs> and he comes over and he takes it from you and uh, it's got a lever action on it. And he, sp- he spins it around and cocks it and says, I acquired this many, many years ago. It's one of my favorite pieces to break out. <laughs> is there any possible way I could take that with me if and when I ever leave? Probably not. Yeah, well, that's what I figured. Well, we'll talk. <laughs> All right. I have another question for you. Can I use it in battle while we're here? 
Unless, oh wait, you're going to use it, aren't we'll you? We'll talk about it. Okay. Alright, sounds good. <laughs> you wouldn't happen to uh, want to trade a little? I had, I've been looking for a Warhammer, and I'd be willing to trade my axe for one. Well, um, not really a, uh, something that I get into, sort of the, the management of the entire thing. We've got a, uh, we've got a, a member of the guard that really handles all the inventory here. Um, I, I, I just, um, I, I've, I've recently had sort of a, um, a divine intervention, if you would say. And my god's preferred weapon is the Warhammer, so I, I really, as soon as I can, would love oh, to trade. Oh, of course, of course. L look, it's not really, it's not an issue of getting you a hammer. We can definitely do that. I just need to uh, have you deal with all of that with the, the head of the armory. Uh, he'll, he'll definitely get you taken care of. My companion does not refer to Bahamut when she means her god, by the way. Oh, that, that's fine. Look, we, um, we have many different, uh, gods and many different paladins of various names that are represented here. We are all united in one common purpose. Does Mikael suddenly get, like, a massive twitch going on? A, a little bit. <laughs> he, he furrows his brow kind of discerningly, he, and he has a mild taste of bile in his mouth. <laughs> Michael, I was wondering if perhaps I could meet with this record keeper of the armory. Yes, of course. I, I'm sure we can arrange something. So, Mikael, do a, uh, a perception check for me. Three. Mikael doesn't see shit. So, you, uh, you all leave the armory and head back, uh, through the main entryway, uh, and then go down a hallway that's on the other side. And at the end of the hallway, you enter a large study. There is kind of these floor-to-ceiling bookshelves, um, some dark burgundy carpeting, a couple of comfortable chairs... And then off to the side, there's a pair of wooden double doors that are flung open, and you can see that this study leads into uh, an alchemist's uh, laboratory. Is this the throne room? Um, uh, Jim, this looks like some kind of alchemist workshop. I'm sorry, I've never really been in a castle, except the one time, and they wouldn't let me see the king. So I still don't know what a throne room looks like. There is a, uh... A figure that steps out of the laboratory area into the study. He is a dwarf. <laughs> looks just absolutely ancient. Got re a really dark, really dark complexion and just like shock white hair and a big white beard. And he's wearing a uh, long flowing purple robe. All right, you've definitely been here a long time. I know that. Oh, my lad, I've been everywhere for a long time. <laughs> You've been everywhere, huh? Across the desert? It's bare. Joan, shut up. Oh, but in my time, it wasn't a desert. Holy fuck, my days just turned upside down. <laughs> uh, Joan is so baffled. Anyways, hello, hello, hello. My name is Joris, and you are? My name's Ramash. Very nice to meet you, Jarvis. My name's Sebo. Um, uh, what kind of, uh, potions do you specialize in? It wasn't a desert? It Not a long time ago it, it wasn't. It wasn't a desert? No, 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 no. Well, I... His brain is slowly catching up. My name's Joan. You, you, are, you're referring to the eastern edge of the world, are you not? I'm sorry, did you say the eastern edge of the world? Well, uh, uh, there's more things you keep going across the water. Well, of course, of course, but of of our. Okay, I thought you were one of those flat <laughs> worlders. Of of of, I I apologize. Uh, the the eastern edge of our uh, continent, then. Oh yeah, for sure. In my day, it was marshland. That the city on the eastern edge was underwater. Wait, the city on the, what can you tell me about the city on the eastern edge? Oh, I can tell you all kinds of things, but... Holy shit. <laughs> very, very bad things. Very bad things. Yo, we gotta talk sometime. But, uh, now I, I think there's probably more important stuff to do. What did you say your house was? I, I, I'm sorry. Did we, we, I don't think we were introduced. I, I'm Jaris. 
I'm Brunhilde. Uh, Hartholm. Hartholm. Ah, Hartholm, Hartholm. That's, uh, that's a very old name. That dates back to my day. You've never told me your house name yet, sir. J my name is Jarus Stoneforge. Stoneforge? Oh, I know quite a few Stoneforges. That name still, that's a very prolific name still. Well, I should hope so. We were the best at building then. I would hope that we still are now. <laughs> oh, you definitely are. You're very, very. Your, your, uh, your, your, your stonework is legendary. It's, uh, it's good to meet somebody who's so ancient. Did, did, did you happen to work on, uh, work on this castle here? Yes, yes, of course. I, I, I as you can see, I am an alchemist. I focused more on the, the enchantment side, but uh, uh, many of my brothers uh, actually were part of the, the main architectural team here. <laughs> oh, we, we've actually got to go now, but uh, I'd love to come back and talk to you a little more. I would love to do the same. As would I. Don't be so hasty. I, I, I hear that Michael needs me to fill you in a little bit. Yeah, but quick question. When was it when you first entered here? Like, how long ago do you reckon? Oh. Maybe not how long ago. What was the time in the outworld? Did you, how did you guys measure time out there? Like, what would you say the time was? Well, I mean, it... <sighs> hmm. And he thinks about it a little bit, and he goes, Well, let's see here. Uh, well, let me, let me go back and... And he, he just kind of pauses, and he, he thinks for a moment, and stands there th in thought for a moment, and he says, Michael has asked me to fill you in. Let me, let me just fill you in on the story. I think that will answer most of your questions. All right. So a long, long time ago, the world looked very, very different. Things were in a state of all-out war. There was the, the Dark Elves were running amok trying to take over the world. The dragons were exerting their influence on the world, trying to maintain their power. That was when the dwarves first came onto the scene. We sailed from somewhere in the south. That was my, uh, my grandfather would have been one of the first ones over. And, uh, for some reason they were very cagey on where exactly they had come from. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. Anyway, so the dwarves started interacting more and more with the men that lived here in the north. We started to make a name for ourselves. So when I was about 500 years old, onto the scene came a, a king, and he was unlike any king that the men had seen before. He was King Ezra, the great king of the northern realms. And through his influence, peace and stability was brought to the land. Now, how much do the five of you know about Ornan? All we know is that Ornan divided his life essence into um, some artifacts and uh, somehow is returned as a lich to our, our plane. And um... Wait, his lich is back again? Again? Shit! What do you mean, um, again? Excuse- I'm sorry, Jarus, but, um, we actually were tasked with finding the Lich and putting an end to it. Y you mean, like, he's got followers and everything? Yes, sir, he does. I don't oh, know. fuck me! <laughs> oh, no thanks. <laughs> this is- oh, boy. Oh, no. Okay, so, quick backstory. Um... Basically, Ornan was a, a dark elf a, a long, 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 <laughs> long time ago and got insanely powerful and was killed by a dragon, but was able to make himself into a lich. And then somewhere, somewhere along the line, uh, <laughs> got raised by some uh, very, very stupid humans. And that's where we find myself in my story. So, anyways, uh, King Ezra and his group of knights, and now I, I need to, uh, like I said, I, he was able to unite the, the worlds of men, but it was even more than that. King Ezra was a, a, a great, great leader. The, the army of men that he assembled was, had some of the best fighters that ever existed. He, he 
he was able to amass this just incredible fighting force, and it was led by the greatest warrior the world has ever seen. And uh, this army that the king was able to put together, uh, they fought against Ornan, and they were able to return him to the, the ground, back to where he came from. Unfortunately, that was not the end of things. In his dying breath, Ornan cursed the king. I've been here for many, I, ages and ages. As, as you have all indicated and you know very well, that was really the kind of the, the beginning of the second age. I've been here for a long, long time, and I, I have not been able to ascertain what the curse was. But anyways, Onan cursed the king, and he fell into a death-like sleep. He is, well, come with me, I'll show you. He leads you back out into the main area, and you go up the grand staircase in the main entryway. And at the end of the hallway is a heavy set of doors, and there is about a dozen guards standing in front of this door. And they open the door, and they let you in. And uh, inside is a glowing amber sphere about eight feet across. And floating in the center is a human man dressed in this fine uh, golden-colored tunic and wearing a crown on his head. This was the best I could do. He fell into this death-like sleep, and the best I could do was encase him in this capsule. Uh, at this point, time cannot touch him, but I have not been able to break the spell. The only way to end the curse is to find some way to undo the evil. In his dying breaths, Ornan cursed the king and then sent everything he had against us. Over and over again, the walls of the castle were assailed. So as a way of protection, uh, myself and every other spellcaster I could muster all grouped together and... And he kind of gestures out. There's a like a bay window and he gestures sort of into the uh, kind of the outside. He goes, well, we conjured this. We made this cliffside into a giant dome that covers the entire area. It was absolutely the, the hardest thing we've ever done. We actually had uh, 16 of the members die just from the strain of raising it. But now we have some semblance of protection. It gave us a momentary peace until the enemy started tunneling. They went underneath and they've been popping up. So now we fight, and we've been fighting for uh, forever. Ever since then, we've been fighting to keep them away from the king, because for some reason, somehow, he is keeping Ornan from full strength. We thought that he could keep Ornan from returning, but the fact that you are here and uh, Ornan has not already raised the world to the ground means that Something about the king's presence is keeping Ornan's power at bay somehow. Joris, might I ask, does the good king carry on him any silver artifacts? Well, there is silver inlaid into his crown, and um, he has uh, two silver rings. We found that in our understanding, Ornon has put his life essence into multiple different silver artifacts, uh, assuming that it's the material itself that is able to hold his essence. Perhaps King Ezra uh, somehow holds some of Ornon's life presence in him, and that's why he's still so valuable to Ornon. Oh, yes, um... Silver has long been used as a conduit to hold the essence of a lich to help them retain some of their power in their spectral form. It is possible that the, the silver items that the king is wearing are definitely part of the power. But anyways, I, I digress. So, we, we have been here all of this time defending the king, and... Something about the magic that we used to raise these walls has kept everyone that was inside the castle at the time of the raising alive for all of this time. They can still die by a blade, but time does not seem to touch them. Then your most experienced warriors in the keep are more or less your best survivors? 
Well, I suppose you could say that. Do many of them venture towards the front lines, or do they hang toward the back of the walls and command position? Well, I... He gestures kind of towards your armor and says, Good sir, have you ever known the followers of Bahamut to be cowards? Never, if they are true and devout in their pursuit of the great god's choice in war. So then you should know that uh, Michael and his uh, group of warriors are absolutely always the ones at the front lines. Um, I, <laughs> I personally don't go out a, a whole lot, and he gestures along the length of his body. I'm not exactly built for warfare, but um, I was up in the keep one time and saw Michael dive headfirst into the mouth of some sort of giant worm abomination. He was in there for three days until he came out the other end. Did he come out? Metal. Did he come out swinging, or did he <coughs> become excreted? Uh, n no. The thing was like five hundred feet long. He cut his way through the whole thing. Jars, I have a question. You know about these silver artifacts that liches use? Do you happen to know how to destroy them? Well, uh, y yes and no. Um, every sorcerer that becomes a lich is able to put their own enchantments onto the silver artifacts. In a general sense, I know how to destroy them. I would have to have the specific artifact in front of me in order to deal with it exactly. Well, all right. We definitely have, like, a silver ring stored somewhere. So, I mean, if you know how to destroy a kind of item. Or do you mean, like, each individual item is unique, not each type of item is unique? Yes, yes, each each item can be unique. Uh, at the very least, every item done by the same spellcaster is go might be the same, but if the spellcaster is smart, they could also add their own different uh, flares to each one. Makes sense. Would you say our best bet would be to bring these artifacts to you for their destruction? Well, so that becomes uh, problematic. Guys, we don't know what will happen when this wall comes down, or when this king wakes up. We don't know if these people are still going to be around. I wouldn't be putting your hopes into it until we get done with this sort of thing. We also don't know what would happen if we bring in the items, if Ornan's power gets inside. Mm, yes, okay, let, let, me, uh, let me jump in real quick before you get too deep into the strategy discussion here. So there is a small, slight, um, sort of, uh, you could say, kind of call it maybe a fine print disclaimer that you didn't read or didn't know about sort of thing. So the doors to get in here are kind of a one-way thing. Fuck, we're stuck in here. Uh, I... N well, shit. The only way to get out is to die. Oh no. No. Not not no, quite not no. quite not quite not quite. The only way to get out is through the tunnels that our enemies have dug to come to us. Do you like video games? What about podcasts that talk about video games? Well, you should listen to Lit, Lit Gaming Arena. What is the LGA podcast, you ask? Well, we're a weekly podcast where we bring you the facts of video games. We talk about new games. We talk about old games. We even discuss the news. And contrary to how this promo sounds, we don't take ourselves too seriously. So come check us out at LitGamingArena.com or search for Lit Gaming Arena on any of the major podcast platforms such as iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are sold. And don't forget, that's Lit Gaming Arena. Hey everybody, RJ here. Hope you're enjoying the newest episode of Realms and Nerds The Return of Warnon with our new, much better sounding microphones. Unfortunately, we're not quite out of the water yet as the next two episodes for the Return of War on campaign were actually recorded using the old microphone setup. So we have just two more episodes 
uh, before we're just going to be on to these nice microphones. Uh, other than that, there's only one more recording, which was uh, one of our kind of like spin-off one-shot recordings, uh, which is just, you know, chilling in the vault until who knows when. Anyways, I just hope you're enjoying the new, more pristine, nicer sounding audio. I also want to give a big thanks to all of you wonderful listeners for listening to our show. We celebrated our one year anniversary back on the 15th of March, uh, and we were going to be recording a special for that. We'll be recording it here fairly soon. So, but just thank you all for listening and thank you for your continued support. Also, if you're not subscribed to our podcast already, be sure to hit the subscribe button in your podcast listening app or service. Share the show with friends. That also really helps us a lot to expand our listenership. And also, if you listen to us via iTunes or the Apple Podcasts app, we would really appreciate it if you could leave us a rating. Uh, Don't forget you can find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. But once again, thank you guys for listening. Thank you to our friend Kyle for composing our main introductory theme. And without further ado, let's get back into the realm of the return of Ornon. Hey guys, it's Kyle. And Nick. Do you like movies? How about TV shows? Pop culture? Then check out Damn Fancy Dinosaurs. For all your movies, TV shows, and pop culture needs, you can find us on Podbean. Just search for Damn Fancy Dinosaurs. We're also available on Spotify and wherever you can get good podcasts. Check it out now. Remember guys, stay fancy and enjoy the rest of the show. So Jarus, somebody mentioned that there was another group that came in here. And if we're obviously in here to help, what does that mean about them? Well, um... I think they're going to help us. They were uh, a little bit uh, less enthusiastic about their purpose than you. More uh, precocious? Well, I suppose you could say that. So you've met them already? Of course, of course. Where are they now? Can we meet them? Uh, yes, yes. Um, they are in, uh, they're in the residency area. Um, All right. G- come this way. So he uh, leads you down a couple of different pathways to a uh, a doorway and that he um, comes up to. And then he opens the door. And standing inside are four figures. And it is... Joshimi Rockhammer. Hey, how's it going? Doran Stormwind and Dracara Shockwind. Who are you fucks and what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> Oh, oh, God, what a nap. My head hurts. You... Everyone look alive. We have visitors. Yo, J-Dick, do we get to kill these guys? <laughs> You'll have to forgive what my What the actual fuck is going they on here? They are rather, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Inappropriate? I would agree with Doran. <laughs> I've, you can't even look over my head. How am I supposed to be afraid of you, you little fuck? Joshua would like to throw a dagger at her. Okay. Oh, <laughs> that is 18 versus AC. Can I roll to grab it out of the air? Uh, no, he's making an attack roll, so if that's gonna hit, that's gonna hit. Um, no, it doesn't hit. It and doesn't I hit. I make a roll okay. to catch so it out now of the you air. Can, now you can make a roll. Do a, uh, let's do dexterity, so roll plus your dexterity. That's a four. So I try okay. to grab it. Okay, so you it. miss it, and I think it actually just kind of, like... It's like hits like kind of just like sideways against your shoulder, just bounces harmlessly to the ground. So you pick it up. Oi, Dwarf boy, you attacking my lady? Hey, she threatened hey. me. So oh okay, God. quick question: Does Joshimi have any sort of markings on his daggers or anything like that? He does. He has a what is it? Thieves can't right is like the yeah. right. Yeah, he's got like a thieves can't marking on there. <laughs> Okay. She picks it up and she looks at it and she looks back at him and says, "You're not getting this back." Hey, that's mine. That's you give it back. It's a personal property Door- of Josh. Hey, listen. Shut the fuck up. Oh, all right, all right. Can everyone just introduce themselves and calm down? No. She has my dagger. Go. She licks it. Brunhilda, could, ah! I, could I see that for a second? 
After Brunhilde hands the dagger to Sibo, Sibo would like to read what the thief's cant on the dagger says. In thief's cant on the dagger, it says, <laughs> This dagger is the sole property of Joshimi Rockhammer, the greatest thief of all time. Fuck you. So I take it you're Joshimi Rockhammer. So I take it you can suck it. Now give me my dagger. So, the stone forges and the rock hammers are mortal enemies. <laughs> <laughs> did you say that your name is Rockhammer? No, I did not. I said my name is Joshimi Moonhammer. <laughs> um, it also says here that you claim to be the greatest thief in the world. I am. I stole the urn of the ashes of the most legendary hero of all time. Tell me you've ever done that. Um, have you broken into the vault in Beacon? No, I was kind of busy at the Fang, but thanks. She jumps over and, <laughs> and tackles <laughs> Josh and and starts decking him in the face. Okay, ma uh, make an unarmed strike oh, here. God. That's an 11. That is not going to hit. So I think instead, I think you do tackle him, but I think the two of you are just kind of rolling on the ground going after each other. Can Jones go <laughs> over there and pull them apart? I think actually, uh, before you even have a chance, the door uh, to this resident area bursts open and Michael comes in. What's going on here? She started it. And he, uh, he actually comes over and like grabs the two of you and like grabs you by the back of the neck and pulls you apart from each other. What is the meaning of this? The fucker threw a dagger at me. She started it. Listen, listen. I don't care what kind of feuds you had before. Here in the castle, we are all on the same team. If you can't get on board with that, then you're out the door. What are you talking about feuds? She's just being mean. Rock hammers are shit. Now you take that back, you sullen <laughs> wench. Rock hammers. Our shit. All right, I've had just about enough of you two fuckleheads chucking around. Now shut up and let's get this going. <clears throat> all right, can we all play nice now? Absolutely. I believe we were about to do introductions. Uh, my name is Joan Redson, and that's about all I got to say. I'm sorry, are you missing the law bit? No, I'm not missing oh the law. Oh my god, he didn't say he was the law. Because... <laughs> I fucking hate all of you. <laughs> all right, so since we've done a lot of introductions in this particular episode, uh, we'll skip it. We'll just suffice to say that you have introductions at various levels of cordiality. <laughs> to which, uh, afterwards, Jer Jerris says, All right, now that we're all friends, why don't I show the five of you to your rooms? And uh, as you're uh, going to leave... I think that as um, Brunhilde leaves the room, she uh, does the I'm looking at you, I'm watching you thing to Joshimi. Joshimi looks to the left, looks to the right, looks dead back at her and double flips her off. <laughs> as you all are, uh, the five of you are turning to leave, Joshimi says... Hey, wait. Did you say your name is Mikhail? Indeed. Did you order a fucking bow? I did. At which point, Joshimi whistles. And uh, you hear kind of sort of a, a light clicking sound in the hallway. And uh, into the room runs a black fox. I fucking thought you were dead. Oxel, what are you doing here? So uh, Siebel's going to get down on his, on his knees. And, uh, and, and Oxel's going to come over and, you know, they're going to catch up. Joshimi hands a, a note to Mikael, and uh, it is from the smith in Timber's Crest. And the note says, I remember this fox being with you the last time you were in Timber's Crest. She swung by, and I thought I'd give her the finished bow. Thanks for the challenge. It's one of my finest pieces. The stats of the the note is <laughs> plus, 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 hey, I bet you want to know plus, yet, uh, plus, is. plus one love because there's an XOXO at the end. <laughs> Tight. Is there a lipstick mark or is it just uh just signed XOXO? <laughs> the bow is in the armory. When they came with it, I had no idea who the intended recipient was, and it went into the storeroom of the armory. I will retrieve it for you later. I believe I have the receipt. 
<laughs> well, yes. However, it's a custom thing, so I don't think you can uh, return it. Custom orders are normally a uh, pay up front kind of deal. I- indeed, I was I was saying I have the receipt for the bill of sale, and, and of course, entitling my ownership to the weapon. I don't think they don't believe you. Of course, uh, as a as a priest of Bahamut, I would uh, I would of course trust you to be honorable in such things as the ownership of a weapon. Ha! Ah! Indeed, or or we would have to do battle over such a thing. Oxel, where have you been? Oxel's been all over the place. I see, girl. To make a long story short, after things started happening at Beacon, Oxel got scared and ran off and went back to the area that she knew, which is the Timber's Crest area. Eventually ended up wandering into town, which is where she picked up the bow from the uh, blacksmith. At that point, a lot of stuff happened, ended up going north, ended up uh, at this random area outside of the Fang where a couple of escaped convicts ran into her, befriended her, and uh, that kind of sums up where we're at now. So, have these people been feeding you enough, Oxel? Yeah, I mean, they've they've been taking care of her. Good to hear, good to hear. I think especially, uh, Joshimi was actually, um, trying to get Oxel to like him because he recognized that she was a very smart fox and, uh, immediately saw the thieving potential of having a four-legged companion. Perhaps I'll have to have a word with Joshimi. Anyways, so you, uh, you have Oxel back now. So, you guys have been at the castle for uh, a a few days now, and um, as a little fun thing here for your five characters, we're going to do a little bit of uh, training. The three of you can pick um, either Sage, Michael, or Jarrus to train with. So, if you train with Sage, you'll get some kind of a increase to your stealth or uh, athletics or something like that. If you train with Michael, that's going to be something to do with combat abilities or um, like sort of divine fighting, I guess. And then Jarus is going to be uh, an arcane kind of training. So you can pick who you want to go with. Zebo is going to be training with Sage. Okay. Ramash will be training with uh, Jarus. Okay. Joan will also be training with Jarus. Okay, so we got two for Jarus. Mikhail will be training with Michael. Okay. And Brunhilda? I actually think that she might have a crush on Sage, so she's going to be hanging out with Sage. Okay. So we'll do the these three separately. So we'll start with Mikhail's training. Michael takes you out to sort of a, a barren part of the, the field... A little ways outside of the city. So, Mikhail, as a... Not only a paladin of Bahamut, but as the training and upcoming high priest, you have focused a lot on the the spiritual side of our discipline, correct? Indeed, I have devoted myself entirely, if not having sold my soul to Bahamut. To an extent where I have committed horrendous deeds against those who profess themselves falsely to be followers of Muhammad, but showed themselves to be flawed. Of, of course, of course. And d- devotion to our god is of utmost importance. But w- I want to focus more on the battlefield itself. When you are in the heat of a battle... And you need to draw upon the power of our god. Where does that power come from? Focus and strength in my strike. I have drawn very much a strength from the concentration during battle. Concentrate, yes. Concentration is good, of course. Keeping a level head in battle. However, I feel that there is something even deeper than that. Not only do you need to concentrate, you need to calm yourself. Do tell, Elder. In the heat of a battle, it is not always he that is most ferocious 
that wins the fight, but rather he that has the coolest head. I've seen many a man that has shown great ferocity in training, however, in the actual fight makes one stupid move and pays for it with his life. Indeed. The patient master strikes when his opponent has reached the end of his capabilities. What I want to show you is a way to channel that inner energy to calm yourself even further on the battlefield whenever needed. And so you begin to train and he shows you some different techniques and some different ways to use your strength to your advantage on the battlefield. And um, so what that's going to kind of amount to in a sort of a statistical thing is once between every long rest, you can use it one time per every long rest, you gain, uh, at, at any point you want to use it, you get an advantage roll on a concentration check. Like for Hunter's Mark or something like that to maintain your concentration, at any point you can choose to use advantage on that to take a second roll. So Sage is with uh, Sibo and Brunhilda. She has you in uh, a training room that is below, it's in one of the sub-levels of the castle. Big room that's been, they got some kind of padded mats on the floor, so, you know, some training weapons. So and it's, uh, it's like a dojo. Sure, yeah, it's it's kind of like a dojo with uh, maybe a little bit stronger of an emphasis on actual weapons than hand-to-hand, -hand, but... All right, so uh, the two of you are uh, standing in front of her, and she's a... So the two of you, what constitutes grace on the battlefield? That's easy. Stealth above all else. Oh, 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 uh, you're, uh, you're looking at me. Um, I, I, I guess I wouldn't know. Mm, yes, I... I do wonder a bit why you chose to train underneath my tutelage, but uh, nonetheless, I will teach you what I can. Yes, <clears throat> stealth is very much a, a, a vital a component of fighting well on the battlefield, especially for those with slightly less uh, physical attributes. <laughs> I know that Michael would disagree with me. We've had long, heated arguments about it. He finds my stealth to be uh, somewhat distasteful. But uh, anyway, no, so stealth is important, yes, but more than stealth, it is about knowing the battlefield. It's about knowing how to use everything at your disposal to the utmost of its ability, whether that be the terrain or distractions, anything that you can use. Aye. So, with that being said, let us, uh, let's see if we can improve your uh, reactions a little bit. She pulls out kind of, I think, some, like, maybe like some wooden crates and things <laughs> of that nature, kind of to make some obstacles, and uh, runs you through some different drills and some training and things like that to beef up your skills. I think there's probably a humorous scene where, because Brunhilde's been so big and clunky her entire life, she starts tripping all over everything and carries everything with her, and she's like, she's got a couple tires on her legs and whatnot, and she looks at Sage and kind of looks down and blushes and is like, I don't know what I'm doing here. I really don't. I'm sorry. Oh, that, that's fine. That's fine, my dear. I, uh, clearly you are uh, not the most graceful being in the party, but nonetheless, uh, the grace of the, the situation does come off of you a bit. And she, uh, she stoops down and kind of helps you pick up a couple of things. So for Sibo, you get a plus two on stealth when you are trying to disengage from combat. If combat is happening around you, if you or like one of your party members is in a combat scenario, you get a plus two buff to trying to use stealth to disengage from that. I think you, you kind of learn some new techniques from her on how to use uh, the distractions and sort of chaos of war to make yourself invisible. 
Brunhilde, she recognizes that you are not exactly stealthy, especially with your full plate of armor. So instead, what she does is she's trying to basically help train you how to see the battlefield better, how to sort of expand your mind in a fight. And so you are actually going to get a plus four to any athletics checks that you need to make well in combat. So, you know, jumping over things, climbing on top of things, whatever it takes. Anything that's going to be an athletics check during combat, you get a plus four to that. Sage, I couldn't help but notice your armor. It seems, well, you're fully protected, yet you still are able to move completely silently. Yes, of, of course. It's, um, a large part of it is a lot of training. Um... There's a lot that has gone into this armor. We've been perfecting the the fit and the form and the, the shape of it for a long, long time. Jaris, uh, he contributes a little bit by adding some mild enchantments to the armor. But uh, honestly, a lot of it is just <coughs> a, a lot of practice. It's learning to move with extra armor on to keep yourself silent. And if a humble rogue were to try and get his hands on a suit of armor of this quality what what, what might I have to do <laughs> well for starters you would probably have to live here uh, about a hundred years or so and she actually she points to one of her her sort of shin guard pieces and says this was my first piece of armor that I designed uh, about 150 years ago. I We've been working on the set constantly ever since. That was the the first piece that we really got to work well. It's This really has been a, a labor, and uh, she actually points to a few pieces on her right arm. She's got a couple of different uh, like leather sort of plates on there that she points and she says there, there's a few even over here that I still don't think are quite perfect yet uh, the end goal is to be uh, completely silent m- more silent than a ghost when I move I. so uh, to answer your question I can I, I mean if you're willing to commit a lot of time to this I'm sure we can start the process but there's not a lot I can do for you right now perhaps we could meet another time and Discuss the fundamentals of it, if I were to want to start a suit of my own. Of course. So we've got, uh, Ramash and Joni Boy. Jars, you might want to lock away your valuables because, uh, it can get kind of messy around Joan when he casts magic. Things tend to light on fire. (laughs) You're funny. It's only (laughs) happened... Sorry, I, uh... I'm sorry. I'm, I'm real sorry. I guess he's right. I, you probably should look up your valuables. I'm a little bit clumsy. Oh. So, the two of you, when using magic on the battlefield, what is the most important thing? Making sure I got enough bullets, otherwise crazy shit happens. Making sure you use the right spell. Uh, Yes, yeah, I suppose those two are both very important, but the most important thing is staying alive. I mean, that's kind of a given. Listen, those of us that are gifted with magic almost never are gifted in the areas of uh, the hand-to-hand combat quite like our comrades are. I mean, I don't know, I punched a few fist members in my day. I don't know about you, but I could turn into a bear. Yes, but that is in and of itself magic, is it not? True. Magic is what we rely on. Magic is what we use to support ourselves if we find a fight has come upon us. Joan, I understand from your comrades that you have a bit of a problem. Yeah, I'm seven foot tall because I didn't have any bullets. (laughs) Oh, no. Um, no, I... I've been told that you have a, a a bit of a fire problem. Listen, it only happened a couple times. One of them was on purpose, just to, so we could. Uh, we were trying to see the damn guy. You blew up my room and burned down the hot tub. 
That was the accident. I said there was an accident. Oh. <laughs> also, when that happened, I, I was gone. I was in some darkness. It was weird. And then I came back and the room was on fire in the hot tub and I was naked. I mean, I was naked to begin with. That wasn't... But I was... It was like I teleported. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, oh well, I'm... I mean, I've teleported before, of course, but, it, but I don't... I don't know about that. It was weird. I was just... I was floating in darkness. Uh, well, perhaps you were in a, a different plane. I'm sorry, what? I mean, you, you haven't explored... The, the concept of the different planes? Listen, I'm a simple man. Out for revenge, because they killed my family. Well, how, how did you acquire magic, then? And mo montage cut of... <laughs> listen, we don't... Well, have, of how Joan tells his story it, of the It was whole just spontaneous, basically. Wild magic. Basically, kind of a montage cut of how Joan talks about... How My he... wife and kid were killed. <laughs> and of course, it's all in song. It was I... my best friend, and I had to kill him. I became the law. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's get on focusing now. Yeah, let's get back to the situation at hand. Why are we all talking like me? This is fucking weird. Why are we all talking like me? Why are we all talking like me? I am like the law. I'm Joan Ritz. Hey, listen here, you yeah, insubordinate yeah, fucks. Okay. All right, let's go. Okay. I think that we can work with this. You have acquired your magic in a very unconventional way. Most, uh, most magic users spend years crafting their, their magical abilities. You seem to have acquired them spontaneously. I think that we can uh, help you to maybe... Add a little bit of extra uh, focus, so shall we say, when when it's needed. Sounds good. And, and you, and he turns to Ramash. So, so you you you're a dragon boy. What what knowledge do you seek of the magic arts? Well, I came to magic through nature, so magic that supports life, I guess. Hmm, interesting, interesting. I think I can help the two of you to gain a little bit more of what you seek. And he, uh, he begins to tutor you. He shows you, uh, some, some of his books that he's got on his shelf. I think he takes you into the laboratory area for a little bit of workshopping. Uh, you got, and, uh, with a little bit of practice, uh, you guys are able to improve your skills a little bit. So, for Joan, on any magic rolls twice per long rest you can use a d6 to add to your magic roll as a uh, superiority dice and Ramash because you expressed uh, a sort of uh, interest in supporting life with your magic through your training what you learn is uh, how to provide more life so, for every long rest, you get an additional 15 hit points that are added to your healing pool that you can give people. Dang! We got a master healer over here. Thank you for saving my life. <laughs> and um, for, for every additional level that you gain from now on, you'll get another three added to that pool. Um, and so that is not on command, but if you use a spell that is a healing spell, you can choose to add any number of those hit points from that pool to whatever you roll on that spell. So similar to his lay on hands, I got you. Correct, yeah. But it, whereas his is sort of, you know, tied to that spell, yeah. you can use it on any healing spell. You can choose to add hit points to that. So, all right, so that is the uh, the training that you all have gathered from the sort of masters that are in this castle. Uh, you guys have been training for a little bit now. It's been, uh, I think, I mean, we, we did this quickly, but I think that it's actually been about a week that you've spent with these masters all total learning the various uh, skills that you've acquired here. And one day, 
you hear a large, fiery explosion from somewhere off in the distance. And then you hear the clang of armor as guards start to get on all their gear and grab their weapons and things of that nature, and they rush for the front gate. The five of you, I think, were enjoying a meal in the, uh, the mess hall together, and you rush into the, the main uh, entryway, and you meet Michael as he is uh, coming out of the armory, dressed in his full armor, and he said, If you're all ready, I think that it might be time to gear up and get ready for a fight. Something's coming. So, uh, you guys grab your gear and armor up and run out to the front with the, uh, with the rest of the troops. And, um, as you're arrayed in the distance, you see a, a force of, you can't quite tell what it is. They look like maybe goblins or something like that are coming along. However, the biggest and most eye-drawing feature of this group is a fiery tiefling. It is Maliocalus, and he is seated atop a dragon. Mm-hmm.